Good morning, all. I am Dr. Bramadi Singh, Independent Senator and Chair of this uh, Joint Select Committee on Local Authorities, Service Commissions, and Statutory Authorities, including the THA. I would like, like to welcome you all to this second public hearing pursuant to its inquir our inquiry into the efficiency and effectiveness of the Accreditation Council of Trinidad and Tobago. The first hearing was held on November the 22nd, 2019. And at this inquiry, we had some, uh, you know, some persons and schools had actually wanted a continuation of our uh, first meeting. So we actually got some concerns that we thought it would be best to have a second hearing to, uh, to, to raise these issues. So it's welcome to have you back, members of the ACTT. We didn't expect this meeting, but it's here. There are concerns, and I think we can actually satisfy all parties. Um, members of the listening and viewing audience are invited to post to send their comments via Parliament's various social media platforms, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. And on this occasion, I have you know, the pleasure of meeting the representatives of the Accreditation Council of Trinidad and Tobago. Again, I say welcome again. It's a pleasure having you the first time. And we are now, um, uh, first time you're seeing the members of the Omar Dean School of Accountancy Limited and the Professional Institute of Marketing and Business Studies Limited. I must say that we are having this hearing in two parts due to the limitations of space. We are now having two bodies here and after this, meeting, we'll be having another public hearing with members of the um, School of Business and Computer Science, the University of the West Indies, and School of Accounting and Management Caribbean Limited. At this stage, I'd like to invite members to introduce yourselves and start in with the Accreditation Council of Trinidad and Tobago. Good morning, honorable members. Uh, Dr. Eduardo Ali, Executive Director. Good morning, everyone. My name is Emily Pascal. I am the Director of Finance and Administration at ACT. Good morning. Should it please you, I'm Junior Nagasa, Corporate Secretary, Legal Officer, Acting, ACTT. Good morning, everyone. Curtis Floyd, Director of Accreditation and Quality Enhancement. Welcome. At this stage, could would uh, officials of the Professional Institute of Marketing and Business Studies introduce yourselves? Graham Newling. Director. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, Frank Cowie, Chairman, uh, um, Chairman of the Professional Institute of Marketing and Business Studies. Nesta Dino Aloy, Deputy, Deputy Corporate Secretary for the Professional Institute of Business and Marketing Studies. Welcome. And now, would officials of the Omaldine School of Accountancy Limited please introduce yourselves? Good morning, I'm Sohaira Omardin, <coughs> Director, Omardin School of Accountancy Limited. Good morning, I'm Idris Omardin, Director, Omardin School of Accountancy Limited. Welcome all. And I would just like to remind members that um, um, the objectives of the inquiry, but before I do so, I'd like to ask my members to please introduce yourself. Good morning, everyone. Ramona Ramdial, Vice Chairman. Good morning to all. Esmond Ford, member. <coughs> so I'd like to remind members of the public and those present that the objective of this inquiry is to evaluate the efficiency and effectiveness of the ACT team executing its mandate also to evaluate the performance of the ACTT in assuring quality in the delivery of tertiary and post-secondary education by local school of schools affiliated with foreign institutions. And lastly, to determine whether the resources, systems, and procedures of the ACTT are sufficient to allow it to operate efficient, efficiently. At this stage, I'd like to ask the some opening remarks to be, statements to be made, and I'm starting with Dr. Eduardo Ali, please, to give us some opening remarks, not to exceed two minutes, because we're running 
on attainment. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, honorable members. It is indeed a pleasure for us to again be here with you today uh, to discuss an issue that is of critical importance to our nation. Um, I would like to ask, though, that if you can give me a little indulgence so that I can pro provide my own perspective, which I hope will provide some context for today's discussion. Despite two decades of attempts, and while Trinidad and Tobago has an education policy paper that mentions some strategic measures for higher education and for technical and vocational education and training, the country still lacks a comprehensive data-sensitive tertiary education system with clearly articulated targets and financial measures for institutions and agencies. While we are fortunate to have what we call an external quality assurance system, which is governed by ACTT, this represents only one out of four components of what we call an interconnected national tertiary education system. The ACTT, and by virtue its sister agency, the National Training Agency, thus have limitations, which can be a reflection of the absence of this comprehensive tertiary education system established by legislation and policy, which our country so desperately needs. In many developing nations, there are growing tensions and increasing competition for resources among governmental actors, employers, educational institutions, students and, grad and graduates alike. Research shows that curriculum is at the center of this controversy because programs offered by institutions impact the knowledge, skills, and attitudes of the citizenry. All of our institutions compete for the same slice of the economic pie to offer the programs that, are, that serve a limited national employment demand with, without a fully diversified economy. This is a huge part of the problem we experience, which only public policy and not ACTT can resolve. Accreditation agencies are the hub of this dilemma because they inculcate quality standards with some educational institutions are very determined on deciding for themselves. For over a century, U.S. accreditation institution, accredited institutions have valued accreditation as a developmental journey. But there are still a few who regard it as an impediment. UNESCO, the World Bank, and the OECD have pointed to increasing numbers of national accreditation systems globally. To effectively regulate our sector in Trinidad and Tobago, ACTT seeks the patience from an understanding of its stakeholders, whilst encouraging collaboration, cooperation, mutual respect, and constructive criticism by all. And that's why we're here today. But honorable members, ACTT does not appreciate device, devi divisive rumors, destructive allegations, or unethical tactics by the limited few who seek personal or private gain, disregard quality standards, hide behind the cloak of social media, or use their positions to escape uh, external regulation. In spite of all of these challenges faced by ACTT over the years, while we're working on addressing our own improvements that are needed, the truth is we have several obvious constraints. For instance, our resource limitations have placed us in, on an, in an unfortunate position of not being able to adequ adequately respond to stakeholders' needs. The breadth and depth of stakeholders' needs have grown beyond ACTT's current capacity. And sometimes there are very forceful and intimidating demands by some stakeholders. Additionally, bureaucratic processes have slowed down our decision making and our actions, causing some inertia. We lack the financial resources to deliver our services. We, lack, we are located within building conditions which sometimes impair our ability to work effectively. We live in a society where some institutions and citizens primarily focus on the quick and easy acquisition of certification. This being antithetical to the culture of quality tertiary education as defined by ACTT. We have to be cautious of and protect unsuspecting citizens of international diploma mills and accreditation mills coming into our country, but at the same time safeguard them from these de mills developing here as well. Despite having capable staff, ACTT's organizational structures and systems have been benchmarked with the local public service by the authorities but not with those of higher education systems in developing countries. And for that reason, we have had several issues. I hope that this broader context will explain why we are here today. We are here because we love our nation and our country needs a more comprehensive tertiary education policy, legislation, and system with adequate resources for our institutions and agencies alike to aid them in better serving our population. We are here today to discuss the challenges faced by our various stakeholders who have differing, sometimes problematic, perspectives and views of educational quality that come from varied opinions or experiences and interests. Making reference to my own professional background and research, 
I am here today to signal that ACTT's governance and administrative structures and systems have some, require some critical thought by legislators and by policymakers. That conversation should entail careful benchmarking with similar international bodies and trends and less reliance on external bureaucratic processes that could render an agency as important as ACTT in becoming less efficient in its decision making, its operations and productivity. So honorable members, having said this, we see this dialogue here today as a necessary one to facilitate learning from each other and to enable us to construct a more meaningful tertiary education developmental pathway for our beloved nation. So we thank you for having us here today. Thank you, Dr. Ali, for that. Um, comments, those comments. Would Mr. Graham Newling, Director of PINPS Limited, please give us some remarks, opening statements? Um, I'd like to pass over to our Chairman, Mr. Frank Cowie, because I'm too emotionally involved in, in this to speak too much. So Mr. Cowie will make the opening remarks. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, the opening remarks of Dr. Ali are welcome. And I would like to um, keep it very simple and focus on how key stakeholders can have a conversation that embraces the national watchwords of discipline, production, tolerance on how the effectiveness and efficiency of ACTT impact on the positive development of the Trinidad and Tobago society. This situation is a very um, ticklish situation and it must be noted that there are several stakeholders that form part of this discussion, right? Um, that would include um, the ACTT, of course, the Joint Select Committee, who has a very important function, the Ministry of Education. Um, you have, I, I can see, the PNM, the UNC, um, Citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, the Parliament, and of course, the media. And we are just a grain of sand on the shoreline, a small institution like PINS. Um, I would like to draw the analogy to a child having um, concerns and things to discuss with parents. At the end of the day, we have to go back to the house of the ACTT where they would have to deal with us and our problems. Um, it was in the wisdom of the persons who um, created the ACT Act that um, there must be something in place to protect the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. So I would like to remind the public that before ACTT Act was put in place, there were hundreds of institutions who were trying to produce and add to the, the GDP of Trinidad and Tobago. Of course, the ACTT came into being, which is very important. And with that being said, um, life continues after where the job of the ACTT is to ensure that um, we become a first world country um, and provide the right sort of products and so on to help our citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. I would like to point out at this point in time that there are many persons in ACTT with the best of intentions, um, and that would include Dr. Eduardo Ali, who has been doing quite well in um, putting forward the, what it is he needs for his institution. Um, but as I recall, um, when the act was set up in 2008, regulations that accompany the act were very important and um, 
these regulations were to be put in place to guide the operations of the ACTT. In the absence of such regulations, um, Dr. Ali and other members have been placed in, in very difficult situations where they have had to, um, to ad lib or, 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 or ex tempo, as we would say in our local parlance, as they go along. And an institution as big and as heavy as the HCTT, sometimes when they lean their weight on small institutions, um, the statistics would show that some institutions would have disappeared, um, unfortunately. Right? So I feel that it would be important for Dr. Ali to have that sort of support um, in terms of putting those um, regulations in place. Um, they have been trying and, you know, um, our, con um, our institution have had concerns, yes, and they are being worked, they are being dealt with um, very efficiently. And I, I hope that this conversation would be a very fruitful one. Thank you. And um, if my grain of sand in someone's eye can cause a great deal of irritation and cause of concern, and we need to realize what's happening to the grain of sand. Anyhow, and I, I, I'm glad you give glowing praise to Dr. Ali, who is new, relatively new in the position. So hopefully things will you know, improve for all parties. I would like now um, Mr. Idris Omar Dean from the Omar Dean School of Accountancy to please give us some remarks. Honorable Chairman and honorable members of this Joint Select Committee, I'd like to say good morning. And uh, we'd like to thank you for the opportunity to address, the, uh, you know, to bring our points here for you to see if we could get some sort of uh, um, redress on it. Um, we want to highlight uh, what we, and I want to stress here, what we consider to be maybe illegal practices being performed by the Accreditation Council of Trinidad and Tobago. And I stress we, because that opinion could be, could maybe be different from your side. So I'm diving straight into the issue that, of what we, what we are here for, where in 2005, so we're going back a few years, uh, Dr. Eduardo Ali as a chief evaluator at the Ministry of Science, Technology, and Tertiary Education informed all tertiary level schools that full compliance of all statutory approvals for buildings and premises would be required if we are to get registered, because we were moving from the Ministry of Science and Technology to the Accreditation Council. And so we needed to have all our approvals in place for us to be registered with the Accreditation Council of Trinidad and Tobago. And he continued and he stressed that this was you know, imperative of us for, so that we could continue to get gate funding. And without gate funding or without gate registered students, you, you know, schools like ours, we might as well have closed down, right? So it must be noted though that quite a number of private schools operate or operated in rental premises, which made it difficult for us to comply as not all landlords were willing to, you know, get or furnish statutory approvals for tenants, right? Times may have changed by now, but 2004, 2005, things were different. And then the onus of the monies to be spent would have been on the schools. Dr. Ali provided a list of requirements. I made a submission and I provided that list to members of this Joint Select Committee. I have another copy here in case you all would need it. 
And this made, this was in, and the list that he provided was in reference to the ACTT Act number 16 of 2004. We complied. We got all necessary approvals for all our three locations, Port of Spain, San Fernando, and Chagonas. In 2007 and 2008, evidence of our compliance was required when the ACTT team evaluated our schools. Dr. Ruby Allen and Mr. Curtis Floyd even pointed out those approvals that would be expiring soon, and that was in 2008. This committee will no doubt understand our dismay when in 2010, at another evaluation by the Accreditation Council, we were told by Mr. Bradshaw that we wasted our money as ACTT no longer required statutory approvals. Yet, even up to 2016, statutory approvals were inspected and listed in our evaluation report. Now, it's important to note here that from 2010 to 2016, we tried getting this in writing from the Accreditation Council that, that statutory approvals, your fire approval, your WASA approval, your town and country approval, your public health approval, things that we're not operating uh, Lotto Boot or a Cambio Exchange. We operate in a school where we have to protect 300 students or 500 students, as the case might be, per center. So these things are a requirement, and it's required by law. You know, and uh, to tell us now that we got these, you know, in vain, and it's no longer a requirement. It was, you know, a, a tough pill to swallow. Yet, even up to 2016, right? And we sought information from ACTT as to when the policy regarding these approvals was changed. It was only because of our request under the Freedom of Information Act in 2019 that we learned that the policy was changed on September 21st. 2006. So let me say that over again. It's only because we made a freedom of information request in 2019 that we found out that the Accreditation Council changed the rule for schools to have statutory approvals, which are a requirement by the laws of Trinidad and Tobago on the 21st of September, 2006. If we had known that, we did not even have to move from two locations, at least in, well, Port of Spain, we moved from Queen Street to Independence Square. San Fernando, we moved from, what, two blocks up the road, lower down, just so that we could satisfy every single requirement that we were supposed to requirement and it didn't cost one and two dollars but we complied and we had every single approval that was that was required by the ACTT we had all uh, Mr. Modine um, we are pressed for time right but I understand your concerns I you have two, two questions two I mean three things struck out at me in the fact that um, you said there was an Ill illegal um, well, I said we. Yeah, so right. We considered it. I'm not too sure right. if so the Joint Select yes. Committee. Yes. Yeah. So at least um, we probably will get some um, clarification on that. And your concern about the, the um, statutory requirements no longer being necessary here would have put you at a disadvantage. That's another point. And um, so very quickly, we just wanted I to... I only have a little this. bit more to... Yeah. So I just want to expand on this to September 21st, 2006, where it was passed by the Board of Directors of the ACTT, where they instructed Dr. Ruby Allen, or they advised Dr. Ruby Allen, that upon passing, making this um, change, that all stakeholders, 
all stakeholders should be informed within the next couple of weeks. That was since 2006. And if you ask a student at any tertiary level school now, if a, a school has an ACTT registration or accreditation, if, they, if, that school, if they would think that that school complies and would have things like a fire approval at least, and meet the health and safety standard that is required for the students, health and safety, they would say yes. So the ACTT needs to come out in the public domain now and inform parents, inform students, and inform schools like ourselves who we end up closing our school because we abide by the law and spend too much money complying. And they need to come out and tell the population that these statutory requirements for the, I mean, if, a, if OSHA goes into some of the competitor schools, they would close them down. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your comments. And um, I guess it's a part of our proceedings today is to, to hear you come to vent to see if you could improve the system. Dr. Ali is new here, so I'm thinking, you know, we can probably come to some terms of, you know, how best we approach this. Um, I would like to, um, you know, um, remind um, members that, um, you know, to activate your microphone when you're speaking and please deactivate it when you finish. And um, so I would like to mention eh, that the, the functioning of the ACTT is very important to all. We, know, we see the relevance in a global economy. I mean, presently now we have medical doctors who are not getting jobs locally. And with your accreditation and accreditation society, you know, it's an event where they can get jobs abroad. So it's, it's a very important role. We have seen too that the fact that with this pandemic of coronavirus going around, people are even scared to go into open classrooms. So long distance, you know, learning, all these are things that we have to look, you know, with it. this um, person may be saying, like, I don't want to go into an open classroom. I, I rather long distance learning. And it's important to see how you are going to um, structure those, um, you know, you know, parameters to engage the public who may now be very scared to be out in a crowded place. So some concerns I said that came about here, um, you know, this morning, which we'll address soon, but I'd like to pose some question to, um, to the Acc Accreditation Council of Trinidad and Tobago. Um, uh, could you advise when, when, when was there a change in the statutory requirement of the registration process for tertiary level institutions? And uh, also, what was the reasons for this change? Honorable Chairman and members, first I'd like, before I answer that question, or I pass the question on to my, my, my counsel who will answer the question as best he can, I'd just like to make a very important statement. Um, because I, I heard reference to different names being called at different times, and I think it's very important for us to set the record straight. The Ministry of Science, Technology, and Tertiary Education as a ministry, as an independent ministry, back in 2004-2005, had the opportunity to evaluate institutions to determine whether or not they were, the private institutions primarily, to determine whether or not they fulfilled requirements for the provision of funding for institutions under the GATE program. During that time, the legislation for ACTT was in parliament. It was going through its natural course. Subsequently, the ACTT was established in 2005 and it really did not become fully functional until a year after, because you had to hire staff and others and put the systems in place. So the point being that at that time, the ministry had set its own requirements. The ACTT being established, a, cre a creature of statute, has had to establish its own requirements. And therefore, the two should not be equated in any form or fashion because they are two different matters altogether. That's the first point I'd like to make. Secondly, in response to your question, um, the changes that were made, and I'll have um, the Acting Corporate Secretary speak to that in a moment, were made because of a number of factors which were outlined by the previous speaker. Um, you had several institutions at the time that were operating 
that had tremendous difficulties in meeting statutory approvals. They could not get the approvals from the Water and Sewage Authority. They could not get the approvals from TNTEC and other statutory organizations. And there were huge, because of those huge delays, ACTT, looking, benchmarking with international best practice, had introduced standards in accordance with those best practices. And I'd like to just mention three of them. Our stand criteria and regulatory requirements, which is criterion one for registration, standard 1.2 says the institution demonstrates the ownership of and responsibility for assuring access to the learning facilities that support and facilitate the learning expected of its students. The objective here is to have, ensure that whatever learning environment you have in place is conducive to the learning of students. That is, are the facilities adequate for uh, for classrooms, for students to engage in learning? Are the library facilities adequate for students to engage in learning, for, for example? And so our evidence requirements were a master plan for facilities, a provision of adequate ventilation and lighting, adequate space allocation for learners, staff, and stakeholders, plans for the acquisition of furnishings and equipment, and evacuation procedures and maps. And we routinely, when our evaluators go in, they check to see whether those things are in place because they want to ensure that if you have a classroom configured for learning, it is structured in a way to allow the kinds of learning that will take place there. And the facilities for laboratories, etc., are in place to, that are conducive for the learner. And specialists who are in that area will visit the institution to evaluate that. So if it's a medical school, medical practitioners will go in who have the expertise to assess it to determine if it's conducive or not. There are three bodies that we benchmark with. Quality Assurance Agency in the UK, the Higher Learning Commission in the United States, and we've also looked at the SAC COC, which is the Southern Accrediting Agency in the United States. And this is what their corresponding standards are. For QAA, their indicator is higher education providers maintain physical, virtual, and social learning environments which, that are safe, accessible, and reliable for every student. The Higher Learning Commission, the institution's resource base supports its current educational programs and its plans for maintaining and strengthening their quality in the future. And for SAC COC, the institution takes reasonable steps to provide a healthy, safe, and secure environment for all campus constituents. What all three of them have in common are similar types of evidence requirements that we have. Qualifications of the health and safety staff, safety emergency and disaster plans, emergency procedures and evacuation plans, inspection reports that demonstrate that there have been inspections of the facilities, corrective actions, policies and training regarding health and safety and environment, and safety committee meetings that may, have, that may take place where minutes of records and records are kept. And so for us, those are the kinds of benchmarks that ACTT uses when it is going into an institution to evaluate the institution. Uh, so I just wanted to make that reference and perhaps at this point pass the comment on to um, the uh, Acting Corporate Secretary who could speak more specifically about the date when it was changed and why. Well, one question though. Um, it was mentioned that a rental property would not be entertained. Is that a fact? Or when you say ownership of a property, could you rent a property like to run a school? Ownership meaning that you actually ac access the property by legitimate means so that you can conduct your business at the institution. Thank you, Chairman. Um, the ACTT refutes the ACT refutes any allegation that its operations are illegal. ACTT remains committed to its statutory mandate, ensuring that our operations are, are in keeping with our governing act, act, Chapter 3906, and by extension, all laws of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, Chairman, in direct response to your question, uh, it should be noted that um, the initial requirements for licensure, meaning for institutions to operate, were initially defined by, the, by cabinet, approved by cabinet in 2005, which had determined that all institutions falling under the purview of the ACTD must have met all legal and regulatory requirements according to the laws of Trinidad and Tobago. These requirements, Mr. Chairman, were defined by the ACTD and the ministry at the time to include statutory approvals for buildings. The criteria for registration was subsequently reviewed and amended on the 21st of September 2006. 
by Cabinet Minute Number 2280 of 2006. Cabinet was asked to note that, and I quote, the criteria for licensure and registration establish rigorous standards with which all post-secondary and tertiary institutions, public and private, were required to comply in order to operate legitimately in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, Mr. Chairman, at that time, data collected by the ACTT during the period of 2005 and 2006 indicated that approximately 80% of those institutions at the time would not have met the standards, legal and regulatory requirements, and also the acquisition of the necessary statutory approvals. Therefore, in order to sustain the levels of student enrollment in tertiary education consistent with government policy at the time, it was imperative that institutions not be forced to close their doors, but be given more time and support for quality improvement. Consequently, Mr. Chairman, the decision was taken by the board of the ACTT on the 21st of September 2006 to simplify the process for applicants and to facilitate the registration of institutions to operate within time. Consequently, those statutory requirements were no longer um, a requirement for the purposes of registration. Um, I have a question I want to ask Mr. Umar Dean. Apart from the statutory approvals that you spoke about earlier, what other factors led to the closure of your school? Well, <clears throat> I would say it's unfair competition because of the fact that we were the only accounting school to fully comply with all the statutory approvals and we, weren't, we were not informed until Mr. Bradshaw came to us in 2010 and gave us a hint about it. And we finally got something in writing in 2016 where the then corporate secretary said that we got our statutory approvals on our own volition. And um, then we got the formal letter in 2019 where it stated that the statutory approvals, the requirement for statutory approvals um, was changed on the 21st of September 2006. So for all these years we have been competing and when we got the, we have the evaluation reports for all of our competitor schools now. Um, and when we looked at it, you know, none of them fully complied with having statutory approvals, you know, like how we did for all of our three schools. So if we were, you know, told about this in 2006, we didn't have to even, you know, move locations in San Fernando. We didn't have to do as much as, you know, some of the things that we've done, we did, we could, we could have followed what our competitors were doing if we had known we were not informed. So am I to understand that that entire process of getting statutory approvals were the main issue that forced your school to close down? Well, we were operating at a higher level of because of moving location, purchasing buildings, and setting up shop. To, and we had to compete now against people who, one of my competitors don't even have a fire exit. so. And they're upstairs of our building with 300 seats for 300 students. So I know Mr. Ali said, Dr. Ali, sorry, said that, you know, um, there were certain criteria that they would now use. But when you look at the evaluator, evaluation reports for all of our competitor schools, you wonder how some of these schools are even being allowed to operate at this current point in time. So what's next for the school of for the Omar Reed School of Accounting? Do you have any intentions of coming back into the market? Well, if we have a level playing field where all schools have to abide by the laws of Trinidad and Tobago, because I, I have not, I mean, the, I, I heard the corporate secretary speak about the change, uh, cabinet minute where the, um, where it was changed that statutory approvals would not be required for schools, but the Ministry of Education still asks um, all primary and secondary private schools for statutory approvals. So I find, you know, that is a little bit questionable. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes. right. again, just for the records, Mr. Omadine, I know you sent a very verbatim report to us. Mm -hmm. Your school started when? What year? 
established? 1978. And when was it closed? And 28, well, at the end of 2018, and our, well, it's not, I mean, we're still in operation. Yes, yes, the last set of classes, formal classes, was at the end of 2018. Okay, fine. Right. Dr. Dr. Ali, um, again, we would have gotten this information from Mr. Oberdeen's report, where you were once employed with the Ministry of Science and Tertiary Education. Right. Let's give us a little synopsis of what your job would have entailed then in relation to the regular regularization of, of these institutions. And the job title and, and... Sure. At the time my position was education advisor, I was responsible working on the issue of policy. There was a registrar who was responsible for dealing with institutions. That was not my responsibility. Um, so at the time, I primarily worked on establishing a national tertiary education policy and other policies of the government at the time. Um, I was nowhere involved initially. I was not supposed to be involved initially in this matter related to institutions, but I was asked to in the absence of the registrar. So in terms of this whole discussion, the issue is the minister had decided that there were to be certain requirements that they needed to be put in place. And at that time, statutory approvals was one of those requirements at that time. You have to understand that during that period, ACTT was not in existence. The ministry was not about setting standards for institutions to operate. The ministry had started to uh, provide funding to institutions or to students attending certain institutions. The private institutions had indicated they wanted to have a level playing field. The government took a policy decision to create a level playing field. And so we had to put a system in place quickly to ensure that they were being somehow regulated uh, to provide funding to students in, the instit in that institution. So there was a registrar who was appointed, and that was her responsibility to ensure that uh, those standards were in place and those institutions were re being reviewed. At that point in time, I was just merely communicating uh, the ministry's policy position um, on those matters to institutions. I was not really the person responsible for evaluating. Right. So again, and um, when the ACCT became enacted, you would have been the first. What, what role you played at ACC? You was not there then? No, I was a member of the board for a few years before, few I, years. before right. I, yes. I just want to, you know, sort of tie in some of the information that we would have received from Omadine, right? And, you know, the various comments he would have made in his opening remarks, right? And in terms of, you know, from 77 to 2018, we would have also been informed in November by the Ministry of Education that the statutory regulations were still in force. That was on November 2019 when they sat here with us. For the records, as the executive director of the ACTT, what stands today with regards to the exact and proper regulations in order for an institution to be registered via your institution? First, Are uh, statutory regulations required, yes or no? Okay, first um, to respond to the issue in relation to uh, these institutions that have been operating, you mentioned that there are some, for example, this institution has been operating for a period of time and it has been providing evidence of statutory approvals. I would just like to say for the record that we have had up until July the 11, 2008, when Omar Dean School of Accounting was, um, had, was first registered, we have had 14 other institutions that have gone through the process prior to them. They were the 15th, and all of them were required to provide for us a checklist. There was a checklist which all institutions, including Omar Dean, signed, and we have evidence of that to demonstrate that they were accepting the requirements that we had set. Statutory approvals were never mentioned in those requirements. That's the evidence that we have. So all 15 institutions that we have never had statutory approvals as one of the elements that they were required to sign as a condition of registration when they were, being, when they were operating. In, with regards to my position, my position is currently the standards of ACTT are what they are until subject to change. I cannot indicate otherwise. So the board previously had taken a position that the standard 1.2, which I referred to before, stands and the evidence requirements stand. Until such a change is made by the board, then I will be able to communicate otherwise. But I'm not in a position to say otherwise at this point in time. 
Mr. Chim? Just one little question. Um, so ACTT has its um, standards with respect to statutory approvals, as you mentioned earlier, evidence of that would be accepted. What about the Ministry of Education? Are you on the same level with respect to statutary approvals? Uh, for, uh, from my understanding of what the Permanent Secretary would have indicated before the statutory approvals he was referring to were with respect to schools, including early childhood centers. Is there relaxation of the statutory approvals that once existed? Because I'm getting the impression that it was onerous and then there was a relaxation. And if there was a relaxation, I mean, is there now institutions operating with substandard infrastructure? As you know, mentioned, no fire escape and all these things. Could you comment on this? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I won't say that there is a relaxation. I would say that the evaluators are trained and they go in to evaluate the institutions. There are times when institutions may drop the ball after an evaluation. So let me explain. We are aware that institutions prep themselves for an evaluation. And so in preparation, they will put all the necessary markers in place, including fire extinguishers for the evaluators' visits. Uh, after leaving the institution, quite often, these things may change, unless we go through another step where we monitor subsequently. And so it is, like, it is, a, it is a, a possibility that that can happen where institutions are concerned. Uh, as far as the previous point or question that was raised by Member Ford, um, in terms of the issue of statutory approvals, while we have indicated our position is as it stands, there have been some changes in the laws within the last few years, namely with respect to occupational safety and health. We are in the process of preparing to revise our standards. We have been communicating with institutions to that effect. We are preparing in our new strategic plan, funding being provided by our funding agency to move towards reviewing our standards and our criteria and our evidence requirements. We have been benchmarking with other international accrediting agencies looking at what they do. And so the objective is to look at both what they do as well as what pertains to the law as it stands today. So where occupational safety and health is concerned, back in 2008, when such institutions weren't registered, there was no such legislation in place, nor such systems in place. Now that they are, they will need to be looked at within the context of our revised standards that we will be embarking upon this, between this year and next year. In terms of, of, again, you know, I know we may be, you know, identifying Omadine, but I think, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a vivid example in order to reference the discussion that we're having in, in terms of the whole accreditation in Trinidad and Tobago. Again, um, Mr. Omadine, you didn't provide um, Ms. Dr. Ali with a copy of your document. No, no, right. No, I you did know, not. But it would, it would be interesting, you know, if, 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 that could, if could, that could be possible, right, in order to identify some of the things, like, for example, right, he, would, he said that he would have gotten information on, from the Freedom of Information Act as a result. And again, with all the communication, he was not able to get that information from your organization. He identified that 46% of the institution campuses which is a staggering six of the 13 institution campuses met none of the five critical criteria set out by ACTT. And then he identified the five, tongue and country, public health, was and so on. He identified 75%, right, which is nine of the 13 TLIS mentioned above were not even two or more of the five statutory regulations were met. And these institutions have been registered and accredited, all right? We're not identifying the, 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 the institutions, but we're identifying the numbers. Umadine also mentioned, again, that's information he provided, that 40%, right, that 40% of the accountants in Trinidad and Tobago would have passed through his institution. From 77 to 2008, you know, what did your organization do to ensure that, listen, can we ensure and see, well, look, how can we assess Umadine? What was the communication process like? We are getting information here. I don't know what communication transpired between the two, two organizations. Thank you very much, member. Let me just say that I've been in this position for six months. And upon assumption, I made a call to Mr. Omar Dean to try to broker a meeting. 
The intention was to meet to discuss all of these issues. However, um, after calling and speaking to the, to, to, to the, to the gentleman, um, we subsequently received some allegations in writing, in addition to many FOI requests. Legal counsel advised that we should respond to those before we met. Then having gotten those to them, we got a subsequent FOI request. So we were not in a position to meet to discuss any of these issues, despite my attempts to do so upon first, what my plan was, any institution that had any previous issue with ACTT, upon assumption I would have contacted them and tried to resolve uh, through a meeting. But it was very difficult because institutions continued to write and write and write and copy attorneys and have those attorneys engaged. So if attorneys are involved, then our attorneys need to be involved. And I could not have met with them unless that process came to a closure. But I cannot speak for what transpired before my coming. Um, that would have to be something that others would have to account for. However, what I can say is that I have made every attempt to meet with the institutions concerned. I mean, there are other institutions here, one also in this room, and I have made every attempt to communicate with them by phone, by email, and where possible in person to ensure that we resolve any, any longstanding issues. Uh, so, I, I'm just saying that we have made attempts to, but we could not communicate face to face because of those the, the way that matters, matters were approached, which last would not have been the best. Last way. question, Mr. Chairman. Again, um, again, you would have mentioned when we met in November, with regards to your institution setting up an appeals tribunal. You know, especially in a case like you know what we're discussing now. Uh, any headway has taken place since? Uh, well, I know it's only um, three months away. But, you know, any headway? In My understanding is that matter is before the ministry, and we have not heard from the ministry on the issue. Okay. Um, Mr. Newling, you have anything you want to add to, um, to this discussion, especially with respect to statutory approvals? Well, not really. Um, <laughs> I, I agree with everything that Idris has said here. Um, I can back him up on a lot of it, but that that was not really a major issue for us. We had we had many other many other things that um, we wanted to address. You, know. you want to expand on the other issues? Uh, can I pass over to, to my chairman? Sure. For, for this, please, sure. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Newling. Um, what it is I have gathered so far is the problems that may arise because of the lack of um, regulations. Um, so I, I think we can all improve in, in that way. Um, I see here the vision of ECTT and it is a principal authority for quality assurance and continuous improvement, all right, um, and best practice. So that part, I think, is very important. I want to refer, um, building on what Mr. Nagasa said, I want to look at the ACTT Act. Just briefly, on page 17, chapter 3906, um, they said the council may, with the approval of the minister, make regulations for better carrying out the provisions of the act, and also regulations made under the section shall be laid as soon as practicable before both houses of parliament and shall be subject to affirmative resolution. So, um, Yes, um, ACTT is going through um, teething problems, but these regulations that are clearly stated in the law and are absent puts individuals in ACTT in tough situations where they make up things as they go along, right? And that has created um, the problems that our institution and maybe other institutions um, face. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, 
Is it possible that you could just highlight one or two as you make this statement? Is it possible? Um, for one, mm -hmm. um, we would be looking at, okay, when it is we have questions, okay? Um, you know, we have problems as we go along, and you know, we seek clarification, um, ACTT as a big brother, um, this is our problem, could you help us um, to resolve that so that we can better serve the nation and so on, because um, ACTT as well as yourself are to protect the, sh the, the stakeholders, but, but at times some of these questions may be challenging, I don't know what may be the issues, but um, getting that information in a timely fashion has been a problem. And so much so that it affects our bottom line in terms of um, being able to um, provide a service to the public because we cannot move forward unless ACTT said, well, okay, um, you can go ahead. And, and that information is, is sometime late in coming. That is one example. Um, so like things like our registration certificate, when it is we get it. Um, well, um, <laughs> I, 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 it, it comes after the period has ended, um, in, in which case we would have um, missed the opportunity to, to um, work with students during that period. Um, some of these things I, I feel concerned, as I said, to talk about these things in this, in this forum. And the media who, who sees themselves as the guardian of democracy can chat with me um, to, to get things off the record, right? But what it is I would like to focus on is the fact that um, if it is um, a CTT gets the assistance um, to put these regulations in place, then um, we would be aware of what is required and, 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 and things would be very clear as to how we go forward. Um, we feel, and, and notice the word that I choose here as an institution, we feel that in the absence of these regulations, we are operating with a moving goalpost. So at one point in time, in 2018, the goalposts would be here. We have to fit things in between there. But at some other point in time, because there are no formal regulations, um, these things can change. I, I, I hear you, sir. But um, I've, I've also heard you said that you all are on, on level playing field and now shifting goal. You had mentioned that, I think. Yeah, and, and so, we, so definitely regulations would help the situation. Um, Dr. Ali, who would help in formulating these regulations? Would you look at those bodies to bring that into account to solve some of the issues that we have at hand? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll pass some of that over to, to Council, but before I do, um, I would just like to indicate that generally we have um, had consultants in the past who have assisted us with developing regulations. For whatever reasons, those regulations never went beyond the ministry. Um, so some of these are challenges that we face in terms of how things are reported and how things are dealt with, with expediency. Of course, to have regulations in place that come back to an agency like ours, if it has to go through that course, you need to get the board of uh, directors to approve. And there were periods when we were challenged in that regard. We had no board of directors for more than two and a half years in the last five or so years. So that presents a challenge for ACTT as well. Um, and we are very much um, aware of some of the issues, but I must say that we have policies that are in place. There are some gaps in the policies, I must confess, and there are some procedure, procedural changes that are required. But we attempt to stick to our policy as best we can to ensure that we treat with the institutional matters as they should, and there's a level of equity in terms of how institutions are treated with. Those gaps sometimes are the areas where you could find some issues. And I do believe that regulations, if it goes through the channels, would, would, would help. Of course, there's a role for the Chief Parliamentary Council. Of course, there's a role for the Parliament. 
but it will never get there unless it's laid by the relevant line ministry to the parliament or the line ministry takes the responsibility for ensuring that those matters are laid. And that has been one of the challenges we've had over the years, for, for successive years, um, to get to this point. Um, I'm not sure if Mr. Nagisa would like to add to that. Chairman, um, in relation to the concern raised with regulations, the ACTT recognizes the importance of regulations. As the institution indicated, those regulations are to be laid before Parliament and subject to our affirmative resolution. Uh, I can confirm that that matter is currently engaging the attention of the board. And uh, once the board has considered that matter, the necessary representation would be made to a line ministry and so on. Now, in relation to the statement that there is shif sh shifting of goals and so posts, I'm not sure what, what was said. I just want to indicate for the record, Mr. Chairman, that as much as there is no regulations, there are systems and mechanisms in place to monitor and regulate our institutions. The executive director indicated the ACTD policies. We do have uh, uh, approved policies in place. All our institutions are subject to our policies. All institutions operating in Trinidad and Tobago, they are also required to enter into general conditions. Those are legally binding agreements. So it's not a situation where there's no regulations, there's nothing in place to monitor and regulate our institutions. Sys the systems and mechanisms do exist by virtue of our approved policies and also by virtue of the general conditions which are legally binding. Uh, in response to the issue of the issuance of certificates to institutions, after the period of status being granted. It should be noted, uh, Mr. Chairman, that the issuance of a certificate of registration or accreditation is not contingent on, on an institution operating. By virtue of our approved policies, registration, accreditation, status is only conferred subject to an institution entering into those agreements. And so, if an institution fails to enter those agreements for whatever reason, then by all means, in keeping with our approved policies, the institution would not enjoy the benefit of a registered institution. Those general conditions are very important for the ACTT. They are the main tool and mechanism by which we use to regulate and monitor our institution. Upon entering into those general conditions, it's when the ACTT would then issue those certificates. As I said before, and as the executive director indicated, there have been certain periods of in ACT's history that we have been operating without a board. And so the issuance of certificates would have been an issue because by virtue of section seven of our act, every certificate issued, which is akin to a license, must meet certain ingredients as stipulated under section seven, the signature of a chairman, deputy chairman. So you would expect, Mr. Chairman, if there is no board, no chairman to sign onto those certificates, then those certificates would not be issued. Just, uh, just one little question. How long have you been without a board? Um, they have been, we do have a board at this time, but we have been without board for a number of uh, various uh, period, for example, the period 15 to 17, almost two years, there was no board. The last board, the board term, there was a new board appointed in 2017. Their term expired May 4th of 2019, and a board was recently appointed uh, October of 2019. So there have been various intervals in the history of the ACTT without a board, and so the issuance of certificates would have been affected in that regard. So um, again, Mr. Chairman, through um, Dr. Ali, or if it's through the um, legal officer, um, so a statement of, rec of, of recognition is requested, right? That must be signed off by the board. Um, a statement of recognition is what is requested for an individual who has pursued a program of study, either in Trinidad and Tobago or abroad, and we, that, we, the statement indicates whether the program has met the standards of ACTT or not. That is for an individual who may be in interested in pursuing further education or employment. Those are signed off by the director <coughs> responsible for that department or the executive director. Right. Again, <coughs> we, 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 we live in a... a fast-paced industry, right? An individual would have sent in a request to us stating that it's over a year now that they've been waiting for a statement of recognition, 
right? Again, what, what could have caused that delay subject to what you would have now mentioned to us? Again, that's just information provided by us. Again, you have the authority to say no. Okay, I'm not too sure what the particular circumstances would have been. It may have been an incomplete application, for example. Someone may not have provided all the uh, information required for the application to be processed, and that might have been communicated to the individual, and it would not have been provided. I'm not too sure what the particular circumstances, but there are varying factors which may have led to that um, not being processed. Okay. Um, sometimes we do get applications from individuals who do not give us a correct mailing address or perhaps their email address, and so we cannot communicate with those individuals as well. Uh, that has happened in some instances. So again, it depends on the particular right. circumstance. Okay. Um, there may have been instances where okay. that would have So we can then notify the person to contact you all further? Yes, right. definitely. Um, additionally, Mr. Chairman, right, you all would have various policies, regulations, guidelines, as the case may be. Based on a breach of a regulation or policy, what sort of consequences are there? You know, like give an example. Breaching of something may lead to what, what penalty as the case? Okay, I can pass this question on to either Mr. Nagaso or Mr. Floyd, whichever one prefers to answer the question. Member, uh, if, the, if any conditions are breached by virtue of the general conditions which are legally binding, there are a number of consequences that can be faced by an institution in terms of institution having the right to suspend the institution's operations, even to revoke status as well. Uh, in relation to any breach of conditions as well, if, for example, uh, there is information that an institution is operating illegally or is misleading the public as it relates to the recognition gain of programs and so on, of course, uh, any actions like that would attract Section 26 of our Act, where in the first instance we would be required to, to issue official notice to the institution uh, advising on the breach. The institution is given a stipulated time frame to comply and if there's failure to comply with the directives of the ACTT, but then in keeping with section 26.4, the ACTT would have no choice but to initiate summary proceedings against those institutions. Um, have you given any guidelines for new continuing registrants regarding the minimum infrastructural standards and OSH requirements to which you must adhere? Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could pass that question on to the Director of Accreditation and Quality Enhancement, Mr. Floyd. Mr. Chairman, as would have been communicated by our Executive Director earlier on, we have the standard 1.2, which speaks to the institution demonstrating ownership of and responsibility for assuring access to the learning facilities that support and facilitate the learning expected of its students. And the examples of evidence there that the institution would be required to provide uh, include the master plan for the building, the provision for adequate ventilation and lighting to ensure comfort, health, and safety, adequate space allocation for learners, the plan for acquisition of furnishings and equipment that are appropriate, as well as evacuation maps and procedures. When the external evaluators go in, to conduct their evaluation, these are some of the things that they would be taking into consideration. Thank you. So I, I, heard, I heard that there are penalties um, from the attorney, and I heard there was a breach about a fire escape. So um, hopefully, if any complaints are made, we may see the execution of some sort of um, you know, progress being made according to the act. Um, uh, one thing, um, uh, Mr. Cowie, I disturbed your, um, I think you on a point, but we, we are moving very quickly with time because we have another session after. So if you could quickly, um, um, I think, no, but before I go to, I think Mr. Newling wanted to say, mention something. Yes, I did want to mention this. Um, in the process for registration of post-secondary and tertiary level institutions providers, this is a document which we call the 12 steps because there are 12 steps in it. And this is what, we used to base our application on. In point seven here, it says, if the institution provider meets these requirements for registration, it is required to pay a certification fee. A certificate of registration will then be issued by ACTT. The certification fee also covers the cost of publishing the institution's 
or providers register status in the Gazette and in at least two daily newspapers circulating in Trinidad and Tobago. So the implication is you pay after you've had the site visit and evaluation, whatever you want to call it, you, you then pay the certification fee and you're given a certificate. There's nothing in here that, that says that you must sign the conditions of registration. That we only found out about this um, in, in a meeting in 2016 at ACT headquarters in July. We had a, a long discussion about this whole thing with ACTT and they eventually produced a document which is called Chapter 2. Now, we don't know what happened with Chapter 1 or Chapter 3, but they, they produced Chapter 2 out of the blue, which was a whole, a whole policy on registration and so on. It was signed off in January 2014, if my memory serves me correctly, um, but it was never made privy to us or to any of the institutions. If, so, yeah, if, if that is on the website, could you have, do you have a website where you actually put things like this? Well, that was only, right? put, on the, that was only put on the afternoon of the meeting itself. So, that was only put on the same afternoon as the meeting, and we can show evidence of that if, if necessary. Mr. Chairman, can I? Wait. Um, Mr. Curry, well, by the oh, yeah, seem to be, Mr. Curry seemed to be the one. Um, is your institution registered or accredited with ACTT? We don't know. And, and good thing I asked the question. Yeah. What, what has happened is that um, PIMS has been operating for quite a while. And as we have mentioned at times, we have been continuously um, registered. But sometimes some of these certificates come after the period. Some, they, they, they come very late. And, and um, in, in light of the opening conversation about um, discipline production, where we want to increase the GDP of Trinidad and Tobago within a, a framework. Um, we, we have been affected um, by the, the timely um, collection of these certificates. Right. So are you all in operation 2020? We have zero tertiary students. Um, what, what has happened is that we, we, we were evaluated and um, we have to see them soon because um, in, in terms of the, 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 the time allocated, um, it, it's a, a costly procedure. Um, bigger institutions, of course, um, are at an advantage because they pay the same amount of money after three years and some smaller institutions have to pay that every year. All right. So again, so that's for the records. Once you registered, not always registered then. Is it that what it's a yearly, every two years it was it? Oh. Uh, Doctor, Doctor? Yes. Okay. So once an institution has been registered, it's registered for a period of three years, and then it has to go through a continuing registration process. Um, the point that was made uh, previously by PIMS that they are not sure whether they are registered or not. Um, they are aware, having communicated to them, that the board had extended their registration period up until the period where they were going through a continuing registration exercise. So that has been communicated to them. The institution underwent a recent site visit for continuing registration, and that report will be, is in process, and it will be with them soon for them to fact check them. We had a discussion about that issue. So it is not fair for them to say today that they do not know if they are registered or not registered. They have been communicated to by us, and I have kept con in constant contact with them through the, the, um, the director to indicate where we are with things, because I take a, uh, an interest in institutions, particularly that have had long-standing issues, to resolve those issues. So as far as we are concerned, they have been communicated to, there was an extension to their registered status, and they are awaiting the final report for uh, the board to make a decision on their continuing registration status, which will be effective of the date of the, the board's approval. There, Mr. Listen. Chairman, please. Yes, I, I'd just like to point out, this is a good example of um, the lack of communication or very slow communication on ACT's part, because the very email that Mr. 
Dr. Ali was referring to there is dated Friday, January the 20, Friday, January the 31st, and it says in it further details on the condition to be fulfilled in relation to the award of this status will be communicated to you in, a, in subsequent con correspondence within seven working days. And we've heard nothing more from them. I, well, you know, I'm looking at probably the, the publication of the registered schools on your website would, would, would assist persons to know. I mean, it, it's, it's a, I mean you're, you're new in the, 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 the job, so at least you put things into place that may <coughs> assist. You know, and I'm hearing the fact that regulations also need to be implemented. So again, hopefully you can, you know, push that forward as quickly as possible to the line ministry and see if we can, it will come to parliament eventually. But this is something I think would satisfy certain members. And the, I think, so those are the two points I'm looking at. And the fact that the, the whole idea of the statutory approval seemed to, there seemed to be a disconnect between the Ministry of Education and the ACTT at certain levels. Um, at this stage, you know, we have to meet other parties soon. So I would like to, uh, you know, close this hearing, but before we do, um, do you have any other questions? Um, Mr. Paul, any other questions? Okay, good. So I'd like to Mr. invite- Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Um, as a final point of closing, um, I want to um, remind the Joint Select Committee that ACTT um, is responsible for providing audited financial statements um, on a yearly basis. And since inception, that has not been done. So maybe added to the regulations, um, they can provide audited financial statements that the public can look at over time. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I would like, um, you know, the ACTT to respond, someone to respond to this um, allegation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I'll just pass the matter on to the Director of Finance and Administration to explain our circumstance. Mr. Chairman, I know that we are required to be audited by the Auditor General. In 2017, the Auditor General told us they did not have the personnel to handle audits, so they hired Price Waterhouse Coopers to do our audits, and they are currently looking at 2010 to 2016, and that is where we are right now. So who usually pays for these auditors? Would it be something your department would? And, and was funding decreased this year, or any time? We've gotten an increase by two million, but that Bear that in mind, bear in mind that that is still not covering our salaries and our rental. We have other expenses that we, we do not have funds for. We've been using, utilizing our reserves. And if we continue at the rate we are, we will not be able to sustain our operations in a month or two from now. Uh, it's that serious. The issue for us though, as was mentioned, is that we have engaged the Auditor General's Department and the Ministry of Education on our statutory approval issue, sorry, on our issue related to financial audits, our audits. Um, that is a very long-standing issue where the Auditor General Department is concerned. We, uh, we understand that they are the ones that have the authority to, um, to do the audit and to contract whatever parties. It is outside of our hands because we are third party in this arrangement. We are not directly involved with the firm that does the audit. As you're already on the mic. Could you give us a brief closing remarks? Probably one minute because we are pressed for time. Thank you very much again, honorable members and members who have joined us here today, both from the ACTT and from the institutions. We again appreciate the opportunity to be able to address you and the members of the public. Um, we hear the concerns of our stakeholders. I've heard them for a while and I've been trying my best in my own capacity uh, and to alert the members of our new board um, on the issues, so we have been trying our best to address these concerns. We do know that there are a lot of uh, changes that need to be made, and we have taken note of those, and we have a process for moving forward with those changes, and um, I agreed that the regulations are critical uh, for the operations of ACTT, and we hope that the authorities will take that seriously into account in moving forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Would uh, a representative of PIMPS Limited give closing remarks?
We are grateful for the opportunity to um, have our, some of our concerns being heard, and we want to compliment the ACTT for sticking to their core values of accountability, which they are doing now, um, integrity, teamwork, and trust. Um, we know that um, there is a need for ACTT and the Joint Select Committee to pr protect all stakeholders. And um, we, we are thankful for that process and to, to, to be um, nurtured by these two um, great institutions, the GSC and um, the ACTT. Thank you. Would a representative of Omadine School of Accountancy please um, give closing remarks? Yes, thank you very much. Um, my point is that we need to take, you know, a little more interest in the safety and welfare of students. And we live in a society where we cannot take an institution's or people's word for it. We must get proof, whether it's depositing money, cash in a bank account, you know, you have to have a source of funds, whether it's a fire approval, you need to ha substantiate these things with approvals, with the necessary evidence. And in Trinidad, you know, it is a must. So I hope going forward that the ACTT could look at, you know, improving the system um, generally for all stakeholders. Thank you very much. Well, I guess we have had a productive morning. We have heard some concerns. We, we, we know there's certain improvements. And uh, as I said, we may have to level the playing field, as you put it that way. But at least we can work together. And mediation is something you can look at instead of the legal options for all parties involved. So thank you for all for coming here. And I hope, you know, if you have any further questions, you can always write into our committee, and we would uh, take it into account and do up a protective day. Thanks. Yeah, we'd like to suspend for five minutes. And we will now, uh, we will take other three parties after. I think the ACTT is invited. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So thank you, Omerdin School of Business. Thank you, PIMPS, for coming, your representatives. Have a good day. We suspend.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Dr. Vamadiyal Singh, the chair of the Joint Select Committee on Local Authorities, Service Commissions, and Statutory Authorities, including the THA. I welcome you, representatives of your various organizations. Um, this, I may say, it's our, our second meeting that we had um, concerning the issue with the accreditation, the ACTT, um, you know, its function, its efficiency, its effectiveness. And our focus today really is to look at the, the accreditation, Council Trinidad and Tobago, its, its, its function, if it's meeting that mandate, the efficiency, effectiveness in evaluating its mandate, and also to evaluate the performance of the ACTT in assuring quality in the delivery of tertiary and post-secondary education by local schools affiliated with foreign institutions also to determine whether the resources, systems, and procedures of the ACTT are sufficient to allow it to operate efficiently. I would like the members of the various committees here to please um, introduce yourself, starting with Dr. Dawn Mary Defer Gill, the campus register, if you can give um, a brief opening statement, please. Thank you and good afternoon. I'm Dawn Marie Fugill. I'm the campus registrar at the University of the West the St. Augustine campus. Um, I will just, as you indicated, I will just give an a opening statement with respect to the ACTT and, and our relationship with them. Um, the University of the West Indies has been a client of the ACTT since 2008, when the UE St. Augustine campus was registered with the ACTT. On February 5th, 2011, the campus was accredited with the ACTT for seven years and was re-accredited on February 5th, 2018 for another seven-year period, 
the maximum period of institutional accreditation conferred by the ACTT on tertiary level institutions. Throughout these registered registration and institutional accreditation exercises, the relevant officials of the St. Augustine campus con communicated regularly with the ACTT officials assigned to guide the campus. These ACTT officials proved themselves to be knowledgeable about current trends in quality in higher education, having been exposed to the required training in North America, Europe, and other parts of the world. Directors and professional staff of the ACTT have, for example, participated in several fora of the International Network for Quality Assurance Agencies in Higher Education, alongside quality assurance staff of the UE. They have also been playing a leadership role in the Caribbean Area Network for Quality Assurance of Tertiary Education, CANCRET. The ACTT committed commitment to continuous quality improvement of the national tertiary education sector is evident not only in the quality principles informing its registration and accreditation criteria and standards, which are reviewed periodic, periodically, but also in the quality of the support provided by its professionals assigned to guide the campus in the various self-study and site visit exercises. The campus's relationship with the ACTT has been beneficial to the campus and indeed the university as a whole, as it has exposed the university community to the internationally benchmarked higher education standards, which serve to both validate and reinforce the UE's long-standing focus on quality. While value, valuing the campus's important re relationship with the ACTT, we do have a few recommendations. The first is that for accredited higher education institutions with mature quality management systems, demonstrated ability to fulfill requirements within a reasonable period, build facilities meeting health and safety standards and providing access to services and amenities, serious consideration should be given to granting provisional site registration as obtains in other jurisdictions. In a competitive environment, this can facilitate business continuity, pending full compliance with all requirements within a defined period of time. The second is that there should be a review of the adequacy of the ACTT's human resources, as while they do their best with what they have, they appear to be stretched. Our third recommendation concerns the need to ensure the communication of clear policy directives to institutions. This relates to the indication in 2017 that reaccredited institutions would be accredited for 10 years. However, the campus subsequently learned that seven years remained the allowed period of accredited status. We wish the ACTT well in its continuing development and ongoing promotion of quality tertiary education. We trust that our contributions to this parliamentary committee hearing would help to facilitate the assessment of the council's efficiency and effectiveness in executing its mandate. Thank you. Thank you, and would your other member please introduce us? So, my name is Sandra Gift, yeah. and I am the Senior Program Officer. Yes, sir. Sandra Gift, Senior Program Officer mm -hmm. in the Quality Assurance Unit of the University of the West Indies, which is a regional unit, mm -hmm. and I am located at St. Augustine, and therefore serving the St. Augustine campus. campus. Thank you. And um, would member, officials of the Accounting and Management Caribbean Limited, um, School of Accounting and Management Caribbean Limited, please introduce yourselves. You can call us Sam's for short. Sam's, uh, okay, yeah. that's easier. Mr. Chairman, yeah. It's, All right, thank you. As we are affectionately known now, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, my, my opening statement, um, in response to the emerging needs for business degrees and professional development, uh, other than what was offered at the University of the West Indies, Sam's found, founder um, had a vision for private tertiary education, um, which gave birth to the School of Accounting and Management back then in 1984. Sam was regarded as a premier private tertiary in institution, and uh, we're the first test to bring a university from England into, the, into Trinidad and Tobago. We're the first uh, uh, institution, both private or public, to bring an MBA into the Caribbean as well. So there are many firsts when it comes to SAM, yeah? Um, we are approved by the ACTT, um, not accredited, but transnational recognition, which is what we are, um, have subscribed for, uh, for the maximum period of three years. We have had that relationship from, uh, since the inception of the ACTT as well. 
Thank you. Thank you. And would officials from the School of Business and Computer Science please introduce yourself. My name is Kumar Bobby Sukram. I'm the Senior Manager of Quality Assurance at um, SBCS. Um, similar to SAMS, we provide transnational programs and have been affiliated with ACTT since its, ex in, since its inception. Um, we are one of the early uh, members to be registered with ACTT. Like uh, SAMS, we have always maintained the full period of three years and, um, and we're here to facilitate any questions that you may have. Thank you. Um, I want to remind members that please, um, you can um, activate your microphone when recognized and then deactivate it after. Um, Dr. Dawn Marie de Fugel, you mentioned three concerns you had um, with the ACTT. One was the um, fact that the provisional site registration that you are, you are thinking that, you know, if you have a, 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 a site that you wanted, you know, instead of closing it down, and I think the ACTT had mentioned this morning in our deliberations that I think they do have that policy in place that they, they look at and give that um, assurance. So have you noted in the past that um, they have been too um, harsh in, in any sort of uh, their dealings in terms of requirements? No, um, that has not been our experience. I think the, the suggestion is more along the lines of provisional registration status versus um, um, waiting for full site registration and, and really relates to when we're trying to operationalize a new site um, as opposed to something that is happening on the current, current um, campus. So um, it would facilitate um, you know, continuation of business, especially in a competitive environment um, within which we operate. And really it was um, linked to, to institutions that have um, the rigid standards in built in its operational policies. Um, and, and that would, um, you know, obviously be transferred to any new site that they're trying to operationalize. So it was really provisional versus um, Thank you. Good morning again, everyone. Um, to SAMS and SBCS, you um, identified that you're one of the premier, both premier institutions. You've been around for quite some time. But I also know that you speak about being registered and approved, but not accredited. What prevents you from being accredited? No, accreditation was not, um, I mean, it's twofold. The ACT registers transnational providers people who provide, or institutions like SAM, that provide international programs. Uh, if we do only provide international programs, we are not expected to get accredited. Only if we are offering uh, homegrown programs, let's call them homegrown, developed by SAM, right. right? So it was never really offered to us uh, because it's not the business that we're in, okay. right? So you don't have any local homegrown programs that would require you to be accredited with ACTT? Uh, not at this time. Not at this time, okay, SBCS? We have some local programs, some um, diplomas, but other than that, like SAMS, we deal mostly with transnational programs, and our understanding is that a program is accredited in its country of origin, so our programs are accredited in the UK, but ACTT recognizes them, and so that is why, at this stage at least, accreditation is, is not an immediate concern, um, perhaps down the line, as our local um, capacity matures, that may be something that we would look at in future, but at this stage, registration seems to be um, sufficient for, for our needs. Um, just one more question. What programs you have at your institution that are local that have not been accredited? We have some diplomas in, um, in about four areas, computing, um, media, uh, business and engineering. And are you in the process of um, trying to get these diplomas accredited? Well, these diplomas have only been run for about a year, so um, we're, we're okay. still at very early stages. 
I think you have to run it for three years and have the first batch of students qualifying before you can That's ask. Correct. Yeah, so, so that is in the pipeline, right? Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. Um, so John, um, <coughs> for, for the both institutions, has it always been like that? Only transnational, transnational programs versus local programs from since inception with both? From, I'd like to get feedback from both, both individuals, please. Yeah, it has always been. I mean, it's, it's, it's not, again, in the ACT, it, it is these purview to accredit institutions like us that offer transnational programs. Um, we would register at the, the ACT, go through the, pretty much the same process of accreditation, right? Uh, but it's to register us. Um, like, like my uh, from SBC has said, once programs are accredited in the, the countries of origin, there's no need to accredit uh, an accredited program. So it has always been like that at Sam. Similar? Yeah, very similar. I mean, our understanding is that accreditation is a far deeper process. The registration is something, is a, a standard that all institutions legally must comply with. But if you are providing an indigenous program, you know, obviously there would be um, uh, more expected, um, you know, so. So again, uh, Mr. Bobby Sukram, at your institution, um, you mentioned that you have a couple of local programs. Um, it's clearly identified to the registrants that it's not accredited. It's fully a local diploma program, as the case may be. It's that, is, that is correct. Um, identified to them. Yeah, uh, as an institution, we do not claim to be accredited by ACTT. Right. One other question, Mr. Chairman. Um, again, to all three participants, um, again, the registrar mentioned that they have a rollover program where you all have been accredited seven years on two occasions, right? You would have started in 2008, 2001, and then you have a, another seven-year program. Um, in terms of communication with ACTT, right, how will you all rate yourselves in terms of communicating with ACTT, the feedback you'll get from them? Right? Again, it's to all three participants. Um, again, the University of the West Indies for, you know I mean, the, 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 the whole gestation period, your growth, your development, and so on, you have identified for seven years, while um, we have been was told earlier that there's a three-year accreditation program that's basically in place. So could you just shed some light on, on your seven year, and then you also mentioned about a 10-year communication was made, but that never materialized. Okay, so just to clarify, we went through registration when um, in 2008, um, pretty much at the start of the, the life of, of ACTT. Then we went, we opted to go for institutional accreditation, which was a very um, deep, um, rigorous exercise. Um, we got um, accreditation for the, for the maximum period of seven years. Um, Dr. Gift actually led the team that took us to accreditation. Um, and then we went back again in, um, when the period was up in, um, and we got reaccredited for another seven years in 2018. Um, the, uh, the type of communication and the feedback that we got with, from ACT, ACTT was very um, instructive. They held our hand throughout the way, um, as is the norm with accreditation institutions worldwide. Um, they acted um, as other institutions, as, as would be expected from an accreditation institution. I would ask Dr. Gift to expand a little bit on, on that experience. Well, um, it, I have to say it was challenging in the sense that the, and it was eventually, I think, in the interest of the, of the campus, because we were required to not simply just provide statements, but to provide rigorous evidence of the statements made. And that had implications, therefore, for ensuring that you had a very well-managed quality management system. One of the challenging aspects of the accreditation process is a generation of a self-study report, where you basically assess yourselves first, along using ACTT's accreditation criteria and standards, and providing the evidence. And even though we have a rigorous internal quality assurance system where we do similar reports periodically, routinely, I found that the professional staff with whom we worked for these self-study exercises were actually quite helpful. They demonstrated a good knowledge of what was required. 
Um, they were very professional. Communication was effective in the sense that we would, uh, we would reach out to them for information, seeking guidance, seeking mm -hmm. clarification. And within, without too much delay, we would get feedback that would be instructive in terms of how we could enhance what we were already doing in terms of a self-study report. I, I have to say that I myself had a, a great sense of admiration for the staff with whom we worked because I found that they, they stretched us. They made requests of us that allowed us to demonstrate that we did have the evidence to substantiate what was being said in terms of our approach to quality at the university and that we benefited from it. Sams? I, I want to take it pre-2008. Uh, the Accreditation Council involved all institutions into training and development. We were exposed to uh, former chairs of the Quality Assurance Association in England. They brought these guys in and prepared us for, for this process of uh, registration. So even before uh, it was required for us to register, uh, the ACDT has played a, a critical role in ensuring that we were up to, to the standard that they were going to set. Uh, fortunately enough for Sam, um, I mean, we are, we are doing this almost 40 years now, and um, the accreditation bodies in England uh, re uh, require us uh, to, to follow their rules and regulations. So we, we were prepa prepared um, really when the ACT came in, uh, finally in 2008, um, you know, to go through this process. We ourselves would have to go through that accreditation process with the, the British universities. Um, we have found that the, to answer your question directly, the relationship with the ACTT from 2008 and, and prior to now really has been cordial. I mean, there is not a time that we can't call on them that they don't respond to us, uh, both in writing and verbally, right? Um, they have uh, met at our institution uh, prior to registration. We have met at their institution. Um, and they have uh, really worked with us to make sure that we comply. Um, SBCS? Yeah, so, um, so similarly, yeah, we have transnational programs and we have been audited, our transnational programs, our collaborations have been audited by the QAA of the UK um, on three different um, occasions. So again, um, when ACTT came into, um, into being, they did have a lot of uh, training sessions and so that we attended and um, there, was, there was consistent communication. Um, it was a new process for us and it, ACTT was new. So initially, you know, we required a lot of that communication to understand what the standards mean because transnational programs are different from local programs and how they are managed, how they are administered, how they're delivered is different. And so you have a set of standards that are for registration of all institutions, local or transnational. So where there were those variances, we had to communicate with ACTT on that and ensure that the interpretations of the standards were, um, were you know, everybody at work was on the same page then. And where we differed, that, um, that accommodation was made for that and it was, it was seen as such. And that has improved um, uh, greatly to the point now where um, for registration, there, is, there are no issues really, you know. So um, in the initial days, um, perhaps sometimes even with the external evaluators that may come from a different background, a non-transnational background, there may be need for clarification, but because we were able to, to, um, to speak to the ACTT and make our case um, known, those things were dealt with. So I think from the inception, the communication has been good and it has reached a stage of maturity now where you know, um, a lot of, of the, the issues have been ironed out. And uh, if there are new issues and new challenges, there is that, that um, that relationship that you could rely on to, to, to see it through. Two more quick questions, Mr. Chairman. Um, again, to, to Sam's. Um, you mentioned in your um, brief to us that you had a problem in exposing some confidential information to some of the external evaluators. Can you shed a little light on you know, what exactly, you, know, you said that they are competitors and you had a problem, you know, so can you shed a little light as to you're concerned there? See, one of the issues with developing an accreditation body in this country 
um, and even using uh, what is best practice in other jurisdictions to develop uh, uh, the accreditation council here. Um, I think it was really, they did not take into consideration some of the issues that they face where they were, I, I don't want to use the word copy and pasting, but using best practice from other countries. Um, one of which is peer review, um, where in, in the British universities, they are reviewed by their peers. And, and in England, universities up to only recently had a cap on the amount of students that they were allowed to take into an institution. Um, so it really, it was not a competitive type environment because you had a cap. You, you can't take more than, than you can, you know, that, that capacity. About seven years ago, England removed the cap. So they're now operating in an environment similar to Trinidad, where universities are now competing for students. Okay. Yeah? Okay. Now, so previous to seven years ago, peer review was not an issue because you could have come into my institution, look at my institution, because we would get our numbers anyway. Uh, now, uh, we're taking that system and Im implementing it in Trinidad. We now have competitors uh, coming in and looking at our, what we consider competitive information. Um, that could be our syllabus, our structure, what we consider our competitive advantage. Um, we have expressed this to the ECTG, um, and you know, they are working with us and, and, and assuring us of confidentiality. But the reality is a member cannot, when assessing documentation, cannot l divorce itself from what they have learned and, and take it, not take it into their institution, right? Yes, not documents, but the, the learnings that they would have gotten from the, the approval process. So really, it's, it's a concern, right? Um, we still fulfill the need uh, of the ECTG by supplying this documentation. Um, but it's really a, a concern for us. Okay, and my second question to UWI. Um, with regards to your accreditation, what would you say are the benefits to the University of the West Indies? Right? Have, have you able to, to assess that, yes, as a result of it, you are seeing some benefits percentage-wise or student population and stuff? Thank you, Chair. Um, through you, Chair. Um, I would say that the most significant benefit has been in terms of enhancing the quality culture within the institution. Because prior to accreditation, the University of the West Indies has had an internal quality assurance review system where we were reviewing periodically every five to seven years, every discipline within the university undergoes a peer review exercise. So we had that system in place. But even so, we, we had accreditation for our specialized programs in medicine and engineering, and to some extent in law as well through the Council of Legal Education. But when the institution as a whole had to be accredited, it really ramped up this question of a quality culture because then it wasn't just specialized programs or every five to seven years you had a review. The, the, the brand of the entire institution came under scrutiny and we had to sensitize all members of the campus community uh, and across the university as well because the other campuses have also been accredited institutionally in Barbados and in Jamaica, our open campus and so forth. So, uh, so it, it generated within the university community as a whole a strong and heightened awareness of the importance of quality, not just in terms of academic quality, but in terms of our, our administrative systems, but also in terms of service quality because the criteria and standards which are used for institutional accreditation are institution-wide. And whereas before the focus was on academic quality through our internal reviews, accreditation placed the focus on institutional quality as a whole. So I would say that now every member of staff is aware that every five to seven years we're coming up for accreditation and that that has implications for the nature of the quality systems which are maintained at unit level within departments, administrative departments, but also within academic units. And it also, I think, has contributed to the university's ranking internationally, because you may have heard that the university is now ranked within the, the, the top um, three to four percent universities worldwide based on the Times Higher Education rankings. Without an internal quality assurance system, I doubt that we would be able to achieve that. Certainly there are other factors that come into play, research, publications, and so forth. But the fact that we have, that we are an accredited institution, I think, is definitely related to our success in, in, in the realm of rankings. So in terms of a quality, quality culture, the external recognition of quality through the ranking system, 
enhancing therefore competitiveness. We have our students at graduation, now the valedictorians, commenting on the fact that you've, you've UWI is ranked internationally. And the fact that they are credited gives our graduates a, a heightened sense of confidence when they therefore leave and they have to approach the, the labor market to, to seek jobs and, and so forth. Does your, the accreditation status in the university provide adequate assurance that minimum international standards are being met by the accredited institution? Because I mean, you have, you have, you have great um, rankings now with the Times Higher Education. Um, what I'm looking at is if, being in the field of medicine, if a doctor is qualified here, are the schools here accredited? And could a doctor have the freedom of movement from leaving here to go to different countries in terms of that accreditation? Well, respect to medicine, um, the accreditation is very specific. It's done um, in the Caribbean by CAMHP. Um, and uh, if you have to move to another jurisdiction, you'd have to comply with the, the um, requirements of that jurisdiction. Um, certainly, we've had um, many of our students go abroad to do postgraduate work, um, and they, they easily accept it, and they do well. In fact, they thrive in, in other jurisdictions. Um, there isn't an automatic um, flow, but there is um, some, some reciprocal arrangements. Um, and um, the, the, the fact that we have CAMHP um, accreditation status for the medical programs um, is recognized by other um, territories. But they may still have to do certain examinations. They will still will have to do other examinations. What about the law school? Because I think our first meeting, um, we were told that um, they are not accredited, that program in the law school. Could you elaborate? Not registered, not registered or accredited. So somebody had mentioned Hugh Wooden, you know. Is Hugh Wooden? Hewitting is not part not of part UWI. Of we have a, a relationship with them, but it's mm. not um, part of, of UWI. Mm -hmm. So our graduates are, are seamlessly taken into their program, um, but it's not um, officially under the ambit of the University of the West Indies. So up to the LLB level, you all are accredited, right? Yeah, are there any programs not accredited in the, offered by the University of the West Indies? Well, no, because um, by virtue of the, the accreditation process that you went through twice, um, the programs that we had listed in our register, they, were all, um, they all came under the whole ambit of, of being accredited. Any new program that we, we develop, um, we send first, we send once it's developed and it's passed, it goes through all our quality control mechanisms, it is passed through our academic boards, um, FNGPC, and it goes through all these quality control um, um, mechanisms, we would then send it to ACTT um, and for program um, um, approval. And then the process is once that re is received, it goes to, to gate to, to get, um, you know, funding. So we don't offer, we don't have programs that are not accredited. I think you had, you had mentioned another concern about the, um, the clear policy directives. You see, you're talking about uh, the, the clear policy directive from the ACTT, but I think um, um, this morning, I think we had gone through that already, where we were suggesting that um, their website need to be upgraded and policies need to be out there so different stakeholders can actually uh, um, see what's happening in a timely manner. So I think that has been addressed in terms of the the stretching of their staff, I think they are very well aware of that and with funding and whatnot, I think they're going to be working at that. So I think your concerns are being met. And I, I feel proud to be a graduate of the University of the West Indies since we are so high on the ranking. I must commend you. We are proud to be you. Yes. Yes. Um, just one more question to Sam and SBCS. Um, you spoke about your transnational programs and the courses that you offer that are credited in the country of origin. For example, if it is an English uh, degree or diploma or certificate, are these programs accredited in other jurisdictions rather than just the country of origin? 
Uh, good question. I mean, it's, it's, it, they're, they're two, it's twofold. It's recognition and accreditation. Um, and, and countries recognizing that, say, for example, the University of the West Indies is accredited, right? And, and giving some level of recognition to the accreditation body that does the accreditation. British degrees, um, you know, for as long as I know, have been uh, accepted and uh, worldwide as recognized as accredited in the country of origin. So I think it's a matter of recognizing the, the accreditation body in England. Um, just to take a stab at you a little bit, the universities that we operate are ranked in the top 1% of universities in the world, right? Sorry about that, Chair, right? But I'm, I'm happy to hear that you're on a global ranking. All right, just, just, uh, just a follow-up with, um, a follow-up to that question. The master's programs, that are being offered. Um, sometimes you would see in the advertisements uh, master's programs from Australia, New Zealand, and other jurisdictions. Are they accredited, for example, in England? Would they be accredited in England? Would they be accredited um, in America? So that students or, or persons who have done these master's program can jump across and be recognized Okay, now I can answer for the UK programs because we don't offer uh, any programs from Australia or any other jurisdiction. Um, Canada, for sure, is not yet a republic. Uh, they're independent, so on the $20 bill in Canada, there's still the queen face there, right? Um, so you can seamlessly take any of our qualifications anywhere in the world. We have had students graduated and work, working in different parts of the world from Dubai, Egypt, um, US, Canada, Amazon, Facebook, or they work all, ev everywhere. Um, and it's qualifications that they get here. The business model that we run in at SAM is slightly different to the, the transnational franchise type model. A student who is attending SAM is actually attending university at SAM. So at the end of three years of a bachelor's degree, a student could go up to England and graduate. Their, their name is on the register to graduate. Same for a master's and doctorate. Um, so it's not like offering a franchise type program. We're literally offering the university's program within here. The university would visit us 70 times a year to make sure that we, uh, uh, you know, our quality standards meet theirs and surpass theirs, um, not just in, in delivery, but our infrastructure as well. So we don't have a problem with any, any of our students seamlessly getting into further um, education, further training, um, anywhere in the world, really. Yes? Very much the same thing holds. Um, uh, we, our students can go to the university and graduate, you know, in the UK if they so desire. Most opt not to, because, you know, it's, it's an expensive thing. Um, and we, our partnerships are all UK based. So we can't speak for anywhere else in the Commonwealth, but um, once there is some sort of a recognition, um, uh, uh, understanding between the universities you know, in Australia, wherever, and the UK, I'm sure that would, um, would answer that. Um, your, um, to get gate approved, you have to be accredited. Um, is it? Registered. Registered, and you can say. No, uh, to get gate approval, you need to be accredited. Right. Uh, and, and I'm happy you brought, you brought that up, Chair, because uh, institutions like ours are not gate approved anymore, um, because we were never, we were never designed to be, our business model is never, was never designed to get accreditation, right? Um, although we go through the same process of, for registration and accreditation with the, the UK bodies, that same self-study and everything else we do with the UK bodies. So we go through the same accreditation process with the UK uh, Quality Assurance Association and the university and the externals. Um, and we don't attract gate funding. And the, I mean, I could go ahead to say that the cost per student in the private sector is much less than the, the public sector, and we no longer get gate. And gate is really just pays tuition, not everything else, yeah? Um, so we think it's really unfortunate that we would have gone through that rigorous process of registration, um, accreditation by foreign bodies that are ranked uh, really higher than the, the public sector universities, um, and we can't attract gate funding. Well, again, that's, that's, that's being subjective, right? You, you, you're in the field of education, right? You make a decision to go the transnational way versus the local, and well, the, that's the way of the University of the West Indies then. Let's use that term. And again, you can't afford to have your cake and eat it also. True, Chair. I mean, it's, I guess everything could be subjective, right? And 
but the reality is we were not designed to be subjective. We were not designed by the, we did not go into the ACTT to say to them, look, only approve us transnationally. I would love if all of us could get accredited, but it's not in their purview to, to accredit institutions like us. Although we provide, I mean, universities that are ranked in top 1% of universities in the world, and our students don't have a problem with recognition anywhere in the world. We seamlessly, you, know, you understand? So I'm not understanding clearly where the subjectivity comes in, Chair. So but could a, a partial gate um, funding might be applicable to your institutions? So not to disfranchise persons who may rather come to your institution than a public. So this is something that may need to be developed further. Or recommended. recommended. And again, again um, Mr. Chair, through you, um, it's, it's, it's left up to the individual institution on, 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 on the road or the path that they want to take. Again, we don't need to go into the thing. It's just that, you know what I mean? It's, it's just that I look at it from that point of view. You will see it differently. And, and that's the path that you choose versus what the University of the West Indies has chosen. No, we, we didn't have a choice, um, Chair. Uh, chair, chair, unfortunately, we, chair, unfortunately, we didn't have a choice. Eh? We were never given the, the, the you know, recommendation to become accredited mm -hmm. because it wasn't part of what was expected of us. Um, so it's, I mean, if you say to us, now, I want to be clear as well, eh? because I think with, with the way how world global economies are going, right, I don't think education should be funded first. I think, you know, housing, healthcare, things like that really should be a priority, right? But what I would like to see is at least an even playing field, right, where students really have a choice, right, not choose based on price, but based on quality, right? And if it is that, that, that students in this country have a choice based on quality and not price, then we should have an equal playing field. It's either we all get gate or we don't get gate. And a student has the opportunity now to choose, right? And, and, and choose again based on quality, which is what we're here to discuss. Yeah? I will just end on this particular note, right, in order to ensure. And I think this is why um, the board doctors mentioned to us that one of the benefits of being accredited is as a result of what they offer, and then again, what they are entitled to at the end of the day. No, well, in, Chair, terms not of, sure what in terms means. of they benefit from gate. Sorry? They benefit from gate. Okay. Let me just add um, that gate and schools that benefit from gate, it's a policy decision, yeah. not made by ACTT or any one of you bodies here, but really government policy at the end of the day. So recommendations can be made for partial funding of institutions like yours to give, as you rightly say, students a level playing field in terms of choice at the end of the day. We just want to, to highlight that. Yeah. So at this stage, we are pressed for time. I think there's a meeting further down the line, a parliamentary meeting. And yeah, a sitting, a sitting, a parliamentary sitting. So my members here anxiously awaiting to leave. So at this, at this stage, I'd like to ask the chief officials if you can give brief closing remarks, starting with any representative from the University of uh, the West Indies. Mm -hmm. um, as, as, as I said before, we are, we are satisfied with the relationship that we have with the ACTT so far. Mm -hmm. um, we recognize the, the effect in terms of human resources. We, however, acknowledge Sorry, we remain committed to, to working with ACTT um, in terms of um, you know enhancing quality as well as you know the the growth of the tertiary level um, sector in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, Dr. Gift, I don't know if you want to add anything. To no, sorry, no chair. Thank you. I'm, I'm okay. I'm tired. I, I saw your comments made, um, Dr. Ali, smile in the back. So. I think you made them a little happy with those comments. Right? Would any, uh, um, would um, Dr. Nigel Fulchan give us any closing remarks, please? Chair, um, I'd like to, to thank the panel for the opportunity. The ACT has been um, 
really a beacon of, of best practice, I believe, because we have been dealing with universities over the past 40 years, and we are able to, to compare um, the services we get from accreditation bodies across the world, well, really mainly from the UK, um, to the accreditation council. The council really goes beyond, I think, the call and to ensure that we keep to the standards that, that they expect. Um, I, yes, they are stretched. Um, we were stretched recently without ACTT having a board in place. So although the ACTT did their job, uh, because of the length of time to get that board in place, we were affected, um, well, our reputation took a little hit, and, and financially as well, where we, employers who would normally play for their staff to attend SAM um, could not because we were not yet registered, because we were waiting for a board to sign a document, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, so, look, the ACTT, I think needs to be commended for their, their, their high level of, of efficiency, their practice, um, their evaluation team, they all, they all do a good job. Thank you. Thank you very much. And would Mr. Kumar Bobby Sukram give us closing remarks? Um, well, being the last speaker, I mostly have to echo a lot of what was said um, previously. But um, uh, with respect to the resources, um, Yes, sometimes we have been adversely affected by ACTT not having the resources in terms of timeliness. You know, and um, uh, for a private business, time is money sometimes, so it does affect us. But we do realize that this is something outside of ACTT's um, uh, control a lot of times. And so we, 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 work, we work with it, you know, and adjust our expectations and accordingly and, and you know, do the best we can. Thank you very much. And I'm, uh, we heard the comments this morning, and I think the members of the ACTT actually uh, realize if there are any shortcomings, we would have to work on that together with the, our recommendations and Ministry of Education. And at this stage in the game, I got some glowing praises for the ACTT, so you, you know, yeah, in the discussion. So, <laughs> Um, I want to thank all of you officials for your attendance and participation, and members of the media, and also thank my committee members and their staff for participation and support. And if there are no further business for consideration, I declare this meeting adjourned.